It was the biggest police manhunt in a generation. There was the most incredible tension inside the police. They knew that people out there could kill several hundred people if we didn't get them quickly. The police are moving everybody out in a hurry. They don't want people here. Four men who wanted to kill as many ordinary people as they could and were prepared to die in order to do it. It did occur to me then that, that, that they were terrorists. That's when the fear kicked in. It sunk him. Actually, this guy was going to blow us up. Overworked and overstretched, the police and security services turned to their most effective weapon. It's time for the public to do what they're very good at. To stop these terrorists bent on mass slaughter before they could strike again. Our hotline, which will usually take maybe two to three hundred calls a month, took 25,000 calls. Oh, please! There you are! There's a split second when I enter the room that I think I'm going to die here. In 2005, 9-11, Bali, Madrid had all become synonymous with mass murder. Islamist terrorists inspired and coordinated by Al-Qaeda had struck fear right across the world. London was about to join that list. I'd had a meeting with the head of MI5 and I'd said to her, you know, I'd amazed we'd not been attacked. And, and she said, no, no, it's very dangerous out there. It's really bad. We knew inevitably um, we would be the, the prime target after the United States of America. The attack came on the 7th of July. Some were walking, but terribly wounded. Many hundreds of injured, scores of dead. Next thing I know, there's a large flash of light. I felt a burning sensation on my hands. Four terrorists travelled to London wearing rucksacks packed with homemade explosives. In a coordinated attack on three underground trains and a bus, their plot was chilling. To kill as many people as possible. And we hear a woman screaming. By the sounds of it, she must have been in her carriage full of bodies or something. In the carnage that followed, 52 innocent people and four suicide bombers were killed. Hundreds were injured. Thousands were left in shock. People didn't know what the hell had happened. There was a pregnant woman on the tube. Londoners will not be divided by this cowardly attack. They will stand together in solidarity around those who have been injured. I found I had no problems getting through 7-7. The problem comes afterwards as you go to the hospitals, you meet the people who've lost limbs, you meet the relatives of the people who've been killed. That's the difficult bit. Lord, let us the dead were from all over the UK, from more than a dozen different countries and from many different religions. I think it was a great shock to a number of people. There was a natural revulsion at what had been seen. Uh, I think it was emotionally draining for a lot of people. And of course, there was this determination to achieve justice for um, all of the families of the victims and the victims themselves. Two weeks after the attack, a memorial was held for the victims of 7-7. While a nation united in grief, others planned further atrocities. Across Britain, people were travelling as normal by train, car and bus. Just after midday, a man boarded a train at Westbourne Park Underground Station in London. I was on the phone and um, this young man comes in the train and 
he he enters the train but doesn't sit down. So he was leaning on the partition uh, between the door and the seat. He was um, not tall, not short, just average height. That's what I remember. And he was touching his phone, like keep on pressing on the phone, like trying to dial somebody, trying to call somebody. So what I thought was he was late for work and he's maybe agitated or getting frustrated with the, with the train because it was kind of slow. These midday passengers include mums and the elderly. Ordinary people doing ordinary things when the extraordinary happened. I heard a big bang, a loud bang rather, uh, kind of like a gun going off or a pistol going off. I heard some screaming and some commotion. And I recall saying to the person I was speaking to on the phone, like, whoa, I think something's just happened here. I think someone's been shot. I'm, gonna, I'm going to go and, and see if this person is OK. The passengers don't know the man's rucksack is a bomb. What they have just heard is the detonator going off. He's lying down on the ground, hands spread out, and eyes shut. I don't remember how many of us approached him, but we approached him and asked him, are you okay, are you all right? So he opens his eyes, looks up at us, and closes them again. Say to him, are you okay, mate? Are you, are you okay? I got no response from him. He, he just laid there with his eyes shut. That's when the lady shouted from somewhere in the train. It's a bomb. At this point, someone had pulled the, the emergency lever, and the train came to an abrupt stop. The train stops just outside Shepherd's Bush station. Terrified passengers flee to the next carriage. A coordinated series of attacks across the capital has begun. The Oval, South London. Another man with a rucksack. Another detonator explodes. Amidst the panic, one passenger confronts the bomber. But he runs and, fighting off those who try to stop him, escapes. Back at Shepherd's Bush, a sense of anger is building. There's a man who was right behind me. He was banging at the window. When he's asking him, was that a bomb? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to kill us? Did you want to kill us? Who are you? What do you want? We then all watched him walk towards the rear exit doors. He then opens them and he jumps out through the gap between the carriages onto the tracks. Calmly, the bomber strolls along the track. After throwing away his T-shirt, he gets to the street and escapes by bus. Back on the platform, the passengers are in shock. I remember walking away and um, looking in the train, in the same carriage, and seeing the rucksack still there with smoke oozing out of it. I was in the office, ticket office, and there was a lady at the window crying. So I came to see what she wanted, and she said a bag had exploded on the train next to her. With the safety of passengers, their main concern, underground staff run towards the bomb and into danger. I know I've got to clear both platforms and try and deal with, with the situation as best I could. So I'm going up the stairs against the flow of people coming down. You know, as you're making your way up the stairs, I could smell the chemicals, ammonia, 
you know that a firework could go off a second time if it don't go off the first time. You know, you're still worried, but you ha I had to clear the platform. That's, that's my job. Warren Street, central London. A third bomb fails to explode. More passengers, more panic, and again the failed suicide bomber sprints away and escapes. A bus in Hackney, East London. And the crack of the detonator makes passengers and the bomber flee in terror. We know there are incidents at three London Underground stations, reports of an incident on a bus. This, of we... course, does come two weeks after the bombings on July the 7th. The attacks appear to be a carbon copy of 7-7. Four bombs, four passengers with rucksacks, three on the tube, one on a bus, spread out to cause emergency services maximum chaos. As the news broke, shaken crowds empty onto the pavement. There was police everywhere. So that's, that's when it hit me, actually, that this was serious. And I started having the shakes. I, I started, it's, it sunk in that actually this is serious. This guy was going to blow us up. You then start thinking about your family. You want to make phone calls. Obviously, it's going to be on the news. I want to tell my wife I'm safe. Let my dad know. The thought that we could have just come to a sudden end in this particular way, you know, is probably what makes me feel a bit more angry about the whole situation. Britain has come within a whisker of yet another mass murder. But this time, the terrorists escaped, free to strike again. We now have four individuals, at least, who are out there who are obviously very, very dangerous. And clearly, as long as they were at large, public safety was at risk. Well, our fear was they would aim to strike again within a couple of days. And there was the most incredible tension inside the police. They knew that people out there could kill several hundred people if we didn't get them quickly. Two weeks on, and terror hit London's transport system once again. The capital had been targeted in what appears to be another coordinated attack. The 21st of July, 2005. Four suicide bombers are on the run. The fear on everyone's mind is when will they strike again? We've had mass slaughter on the London tube. We've had the failed bombings, and the police know there are four men with the capacity to kill on the run. The police, who had spent the last two weeks working around the clock on the 7-7 massacre, now had an entirely new threat to focus on. We've got to now grab all of as much energy as we can, bring the team together that are already working at their full capacity to rise to another challenge. Under enormous pressure, the police start their investigation. It was a case of searching for any forensic clues that might be available to us. Uh, it was a matter of deciding when the appeal to the public should be made and preparing ourselves for the, the tidal wave of uh, information and help that we thought we would probably get. That same night, the forensic team at Shepherd's Bush make the first breakthrough. They find a number of ripped up pictures of a young man and crucially, his gym pass. Clearly, this was a very significant find. It was probably the first event that uh, began to make me feel that we were making a little bit of progress. His name was Hussein Osman, an Ethiopian who settled in Britain in his teens. He is the Shepherd's Bush bomber. Osman's gym pass led police to an address here in South London. Detectives knew they had to act immediately, and by 6 a.m., a surveillance team was in place right here. It was to lead to an astonishing chain of events. At 9.30, a man leaves the block of flat. 